five hard learned lessons in astro imaging that I've had. RJ45 cables can break. These are those little network slash telephone cables that you plug into the hand controller port to remove the hand controller and allow you to control your mount via the PC. The problem with them is if a cable gets in there and then wrenches that clip forward, over time it can snap off and that renders the cable effectively useless. But does it? I found a solution. These little things that you can see on the screen here, these little clips, go in, replace that little clip there and are an excellent medium term solution until you can buy a new cable or replace the jack on the cable that's broken. Next, USB cables. This is pretty easy to remember. USB 3.0 has a maximum cable length of three meters. USB 3.1 is more restrictive, cable length of one meter and USB 2.0 good to five meters. Now, most of our rigs run both a combination of USB 2.0 and 3.0. So USB 3.0, if you intend it to run it through the same cable, is a limiting factor there. I had a hard disconnect of my mount from my computer the other night during an automated imaging session. The problem with that is that Nina will not attempt a mount reconnection. So if your mount disconnects and you're in bed or you're off doing something else, that is it. Your imaging session is finished. Yeah, I fucked up, but you know what? I know in my heart, I got it. And I think the core problem is that I'm using a USB 3.0 cable that it's too long. I've got two of them bridged together. So there could be some problems there with signal reflections where the first bit is not getting enough of a delay before the second bit comes through the cable. And on Amazon, I can purchase these active USB cables, which adopt a five volt, two amp, USB power source and have a signal amplification module in the cable to allow you to push your USB 3.0 cables up to 15 meters. Now I purchased a 10 meter cable. That should be more than enough for me, but we'll get to that in a second. There is something else I need to tell you about and we'll see how that longer active USB 3 cable goes. Telescope Live, you can go and get their data. They are having a massive sale now between the 12th and the 26th of this month where the first 100 people to purchase credits will get a massive 60% discount. Now, credits are normally about a pound 40 each, so do the math on that. That is a massive saving. After the first 100 people, all credits will be on sale at 50% off until the 26th of the month. Now, I received an email from Marco, the founder of Telescope Live the other day, talking about Telescope Live 4.0, which is a massive update to the way they're doing business. I'll leave a link to that email here. There's some pretty exciting stuff going on, including branching out to allow people who own rigs to contribute data sets to Telescope Live. Next, let's talk about what relates to cable length, and that is the situation of your rig. Now, if you set up your rig in summer when the air is drier, and the temperatures are higher, you may not have a problem with local condensation sources. What do I mean by that? Boilers, for example, right out on the roof next to where my rig is, is a boiler outlet pipe, a chimney stack, basically. It was fine in summertime because any condensation that was put into the air from that chimney stack would quickly evaporate and I'd have no problems. It's now winter. It's colder, much colder. What's the problem with that? Well, that cloud that comes out of that chimney stack hangs around a lot longer. I went outside last night to put the cover on my rig because the cloud was moving in and there may have been some rain. And what I noticed was the boiler chimney stack was activated and this massive cloud generator was right next to my rig. And there was like this inversion layer just above the chimney stack. So that cloud was coming up, hitting that inversion layer and just spreading out over my rig. I'm gonna have to move my rig further down the roof away from that cloud generator, let's call it. Obviously there, I'm gonna need longer power cables and longer USB cables. Now, dew is a problem if you live in humid areas. Last night, it was hitting three degrees Celsius and 94% humidity. However, my dew was under control, thankfully. And that was because I've actually increased the temperature on my tech cooled imaging camera to minus five degrees Celsius from what it was previously, which was minus 10 degrees Celsius. Now, the colder you choose to run your camera sensor, the more likely you are to encounter dew on your AR pane if you haven't taken additional steps to try and prevent you from forming. What do I mean by that? Well, these tech cooled cameras come with an inbuilt dew heater on the AR pane in front of the sensor. And that is there 
to prevent that dew from forming. However, the colder you run that sensor, the more likely it is that that AR dew heater will not be able to cope with the conditions. And that's what happened with my Altair Hypercam 26M. So as you can see on the screen here, I had to fit a separate aftermarket dew heating ring onto the body of the camera, and that's worked quite well for me. Image a target in the summertime, and then also intend to image that target in the wintertime, like there are some targets that are high all year round, then the temperature that you pick needs to cope for both summer and winter. If you're in an area that gets colder than minus five degrees Celsius, and you've chosen to image at minus five degrees Celsius on the sensor, your sensor will not be able to run hotter than the temperature you've chosen. It always has to be colder than the ambient temperature. So if it's getting to minus six outside, you at least want the camera sensor temperature colder than minus six. With German equatorial mounts that correct for the Earth's rotation, they move through the zenith, which is where the telescope is pointing vertically up through the least amount of atmosphere, and then generally are allowed to continue a little bit past that, where the camera is getting lowered on one side, think of a fulcrum, the camera is getting lowered on one side, and the counterweights are getting raised on the other side. And we generally don't want that situation to persist for too long, raising the counterweights too high above level, because the mount is not generally designed to work that way and you will get less than ideal guiding in that situation. So in order to prevent the counterweights from rising too far into the air, we perform what's called a meridian flip where we then move the camera and telescope to the opposite side of the pier or mount and that then allows the camera and telescope to continue tracking but instead as the target now continues to move across the night sky the camera and telescope are now getting raised into the air and the counterweights are getting lowered so this is why we perform a meridian flip now, the settings that you choose in your imaging software for the Meridian Flip are numerous. If you have a long telescope where the camera is hanging a fair way down, there can be a situation where if you allow it to proceed for too long, the camera is at risk of contacting the legs of your tripod. In this situation, you may want to pause your mount tracking some minutes, maybe four or five minutes before the Meridian Flip to uh, make sure that it performs the meridian flip without the camera coming anywhere near the legs of the tripod. That's the first thing. However, if you have a wide field rig with a short telescope like an 80 Apos, there's no real risk of your camera hitting the leg of the tripod anywhere within that meridian window. So you may as well allow it to continue all the way through to Zenith and then a little bit past, maybe five minutes past, and then perform the meridian flip. Now, if you are a Nina user, you would want to make sure that you have, and this is from conversations I had with Stefan Berg, the creator of Nina, generally you want the sense side of peer option enabled. He said that there's no real good reason for not having that enabled unless you are on a very old version of ASCOM, I believe. If you're getting something out of this video, please hit subscribe and help the channel out. Your support means everything to me.